Before turning to chapter 10, let's review a bit of what we've accomplished. In chapter one, we surveyed the entire book. Well, we surveyed the most important concepts in the entire book. In other words, we talked about what an argument is, how you can identify its elements, how you can distinguish an argument from a non-argument. And then we looked at two modes of argumentation. We looked at deductive or non-experiential reasoning, and we looked at inductive or experiential reasoning. We then focused our attention on informal fallacies, namely those modes of inductive reasoning where the inference is so weak as to render the argument deeply erroneous. And we looked at ways that we can classify uh, such arguments. We then turned our attention to two systems of deductive reasoning, categorical logic and natural deduction. Now we return our attention to inductive reasoning. We're going to look at analogical arguments and causal reasoning and scientific argumentation. You're going to find that analogical reasoning and causal reasoning, as well as the basics of scientific reasoning, are already familiar to you. These are arguably the most common modes of reasoning in our daily lives. To get started, let me show you what I mean. First, take a look at this picture. It's a cute bunny rabbit. Now, there's an adorable duck. Next, a cute little pony. What do you think is going to be the next image? In other words, when you look at what each of these creatures have in common, you say to yourself, ah, they're animals. Since the first creature was an animal, the second creature was an animal, and the third creature was an animal, I'm going to say that the next picture that I see is going to be an animal. And you're right, oink oink. But is it going to be the case that the next picture must be one of an animal? In other words, just because what each of these photos have in common with the others is that they're photos of animals, that doesn't guarantee that the next photo will be of an animal. It could be of, I don't know, a watering can. So the basic difference between experiential reasoning, specifically analogical reasoning or analogical inferences, is that we're working to a conclusion based on experience, not on any structure of the reasoning. That said, analogical arguments do follow patterns or frameworks. First, let's talk about what an analogy is. An analogy indicates that there are similarities between two or more things. When we reason analogically, what we do is we draw an inference about one of those things based on its similarities with another of those things. In other words, suppose that we have two items, X and Y. They each have certain characteristics in common. We know something about one of those items, namely X. What we know about X, we don't know about Y, but based on the similarities between X and Y, we infer that Y also has the characteristic. So let's think about the uh, example that I just showed you before, where we saw uh, a, picture, a series of pictures of animals. Uh, we saw that the first picture and the second picture had the following similarity. Um, the commonality is that they are pictures of animals. And on the basis of that commonality, we draw an inference about the next picture that we're going to see. That's one way that we can reason analogically. The framework that you see here, X and Y have characteristics A, B, C, X has characteristic K, so Y probably has characteristic K, is uh, also a very common framework. In fact, this is the framework we're going to use when we study analogical inferences. So um, let's think about 
the uh, commonalities in terms of areas of overlap. Suppose that Steve and Mike are friends. Suppose further that Steve and Mike share a lot in common. So let's say Steve and Mike like the same sort of music. Uh, they like engaging in the same sorts of activities like skateboarding. Uh, they also like to study the same subjects in school. And suppose uh, further that they have similar taste in clothing. Now, suppose that we find out that Steve likes F, where F happens to be a particular brand of jean. We draw an inference based on what Steve and Mike already have in common, that since Steve likes a particular brand of jean, Mike will like it also. Again, we're not guaranteed that this conclusion is true. The question is, how likely is it true? Well, to answer the question of how likely it is that a conclusion based on an analogical uh, comparison between items is true is going to involve several criteria. First, let's think about what it is that's being compared. In this case, read the example and then answer the question, what is it that's being compared to what? Okay, first, we have Senator Bachman's husband and me. So the husband and I are supposed to have certain things in common, and on the basis of that commonality, an inference is drawn about me. Formalizing the argument somewhat, although don't think of formalization in terms of deductive formalization. We're just talking about, um, in a sense, abstracting away from the content of the argument to reveal the items that are being compared and what uh, the comparisons are. So we get Senator Box Bachman's husband, which is X, and Y, which is me. X and Y have certain things in common. Both are born in Europe, or were born in Europe. Both lived there for a number of years, and both are EU citizens. What we know about X is more than what is asserted about Y, namely that X has children in EU, uh, sorry, that X has children that are EU citizens. The conclusion is that wise children are also probably EU citizens. So let's look now at the criteria for analyzing whether or not the conclusion is probably true, where the conclusion is the inference from an analogy. We want to look at the number of things that are being compared the variety of things being compared, the number of characteristics that are claimed to be similar, and the relevance of the characteristics. Let's look at this example in blue. My father's Toyota Prius and my mother's Honda Civic Hybrid have the same engine size and are the same color. My father's car averages 48 miles of gallon, uh, sorry, my my father's car averages 48 miles per gallon of gasoline. Therefore, my mother's car will probably average 48 miles per gallon as well. So there are two things being compared, Toyota Prius, Honda Civic, hybrid. The variety of things is uh, narrow uh, or small, main, mainly uh, just types of car. The number of characteristics claimed to be similar are two, and then the relevance of the characteristics is only the engine size, not the color, right? Why are we talking about um, the relevance of characteristics? Well, we want to know if what's being compared is relevant to the conclusion. So the miles per gallon is relevant to engine size. Okay, let's take these items 
and consider the same argument we looked at in the first uh, example where I asked you to consider what's being compared to what. Senator Bachman's husband and myself are the two things being compared. We don't know if the number of years lived in uh, the European countries are, is relevant. We know that uh, both Senator Bachman's husband and I were born in Europe and lived there for a number of years. We also know that each is a, an EU citizen. The characteristics also appear to be relevant to the conclusion, namely the claim that the daughter, my daughter, is probably an EU citizen too. Now let's look at how we can employ not just the elements that we're going to need to know about in order to draw the inference, but also how we can test the relative strength or weakness of a given argument. More specifically, we want to focus on uh, disanalogies, and we also want to focus on counteranalogies. First, a disanalogy is a relevant or irrelevant dissimilarity between those things being compared. Obviously, relevant dis disanalogies or dissimilarities are important. Re irrelevant dissimilarities or disanalogies are not. Let's take a look at an analogical argument and then take a look at disanalogies between watches and snowflakes and see which ones you think are relevant and which ones are irrelevant to the conclusion asserted in the original argument. So the original analogical argument goes like this. Watches and snowflakes are complexly structured. They are also beautiful. Watches reflect intelligent design. So snowflakes re reflect intelligent design as well. Here are some disanalogies. Watches are made from metal and sometimes digital technologies. Snowflakes are made of freezing water. A, snowf a snowflake's structure is determined by the collision of a pollen or dust particle with water, while a watch's structure is determined by a watchmaker. In addition, counteranalogies, as well as unintended consequences, are both really helpful to determining whether or not a given analogical inference is strong. When we construct a counteranalogy, what we do is we use the items in question in the original argument, but we generate a new analogical inference that uh, draws a different result. Here's the same example of the watch and snowflake argument, and then next to it is a counter analogy. Watches and snowflakes are structured uh, complexly. They are also beautiful. Watches reflect intelligent design, so snowflakes reflect intelligent design as well. Counter analogy works as follows. Watches and snowflakes are complexly structured. They're also beautiful. Watches tell time, so snowflakes tell time too. Now let's go ahead and take a look at a counter example. When we think about the unintended consequences of an analogy, we think about what inferences might be drawn that are also consequences of the similarities between the two things, but are not consequences that the arguer intends to draw. So recall earlier the argument involving Steve and Mike, and uh, we can imagine that um, Mike's dad has bought um, a pair of jeans for Steve based on comparing Steve and Mike's shared tastes. Now, the unintended consequence of the comparison is as follows. If it's the case that Steve and Mike like the same sorts of things, then, since Steve is a smoker, then Mike should be a smoker as well. Obviously, 
um, what we would hope, obviously, uh, Mike's dad would say, no, he wouldn't want uh, his son to pick up smoking just because his son's friend smokes. Uh, but this is a potential unintended consequence of the comparison. So typically, it's the case that an argument um, for which a counter analogy or an unintended consequence can be constructed is one that is uh, being critiqued. Let's go ahead and take a bit, uh, or sorry, take a moment to look at the example and then to look at the disanalogy and unintended consequences. So the example reads as follows. Russia and China should stop supporting the current regime in Oblivia. Whenever a CEO fails to run a corporation effectively, the board members are justified in firing that CEO for mismanagement, multiple union strikes, and loss of worker confidence. Oblivia's lack of or sorry, Oblivia's current lack of government control has led to extreme violence and unrest between competing factions, leading to the murder of thousands of innocent civilians and children. Therefore, Russia and China must follow the rest of the countries in the UN by not supporting Oblivia's government. The disanalogy is that the influence countries have over each other is rather different from the influence that a corporate board, for example, has over a CEO. Employment dissatisfaction and wartime casualties are not at all the same things. In addition, the comparison has the following unintended consequence. Firing a CEO often requires monetary compensation given to that CEO. So it would seem on, this, on the basis of this comparison that the current regime that is put out would have to be compensated as well. I hope this brief introduction to analogical reasoning is helpful to you as, your work, as you work your way through the chapter and its exercises.